Now this presentation today is intended to convey the changes to the new version of the Wind Action Standard, AES NZS 1170.2, 2021. Um, it lasts for about 45 minutes. Now I happen to be the chair of the Standards Australia Committee which did the work on uh, the revisions to the standard over the last three and a half years, uh, but there are many other people that contributed I'd like to uh, give them, acknowledge their contributions and I have listed uh, some of the names that, of people that contributed at the end of the presentation. Now this year marks 50 years actually since the, the first uh, Winlow standard was published in Australia. You see on the left there, CA 34 part 2 1971. Well of course there's been a lot of different versions in the last 50 years. Um, roughly every 10 or 12 years we, we tend to have a fairly major revision. Um, so I've just put a few of the, uh, the covers from the previous versions on there, by no means all of them in the last 50 years. That The CA 34 part 2 of 1971 was the first wind load standard. It was the first official wind load standard. There was an interim standard 350 uh, that was available for almost 20 years before that, but I haven't included that in the in the list. Well, there have been a few changes to the, the basic layout and format of the standard. Um, for example, the, um, the definitions and the notation, which you might recall from the 2011 version, were in the first two appendices, have now been moved to the front end of the standard, and section one, actually, of the standard. This was a decision by Standards Australia and causes quite a few headaches, as you can imagine, from having to renumber all the appendices. So down the bottom there you see that Appendix C in um, the 2011 version becomes Appendix A in the 2021 version, etc. Um, another change was, which was the decision of the committee, was to change the C fig, which is the shape factor, of course. Um, we're actually calling it C shape. Um, which uh, probably makes a bit more sense. Um, there have been other changes in there to do with the notes, uh, which I won't bore you with the details, but basically all notes in the new standard are informative. They're not normative or compulsory parts of the standard. So that's e easier to remember, I think. Well, section 2.5.5 in the standard is a section called Number of Stress Exceedances Produced by Wind Loading. Um, now, the, the, there were a lot of comments in the public comment period about this clause. I think uh, people didn't really understand when it should be used and how it should be used. So as a result of that, we've added a few notes there, which I've reproduced. Um, which is, it gives a lot more information on the purpose of that section. And the graph in there, which gives a graph of uh, the number of wind load cycles as a fraction of the maximum, uh, this, these are stress cycles, I should say, uh, as a function of the maximum stress during a, a lifetime of a structure. Um, so you can read those notes when you, when, you get, you can, when you get your standard and hopefully that'll clarify some of the questions that were being asked. Now clause 258 is impact loading from windboard debris. Uh, this has been in the standard for quite a few versions. Um, the questions are being asked of what happens when you've got an impact on a surface that's not either horizontal or vertical. Uh, so obviously if you've got a pitch roof at an angle to the horizontal, should you use the same uh, missile test speed in that case? Um, well, we've, we've clarified that by adding that uh, item number two there, Roman two, which I've ringed in red um, to clarify that. So it depends on the, on the actual roof slope, what the, um, the VR is, which is all the, sorry, the, the fraction of the, v, of the regional wind speed that you're using for the testing speed. So this is of interest obviously to people, mainly people in um, designing structures for the cyclonic regions. Well, clause 3.2 and table 3.1a 
for the regional wind speeds is probably the most important clause and table in the standard for Australian structures um, because uh, it needs to be used for every for wind loads for every structure. Um, so um, that clause and that table and the corresponding one for New Zealand, which is uh, Table 3.1b, have been examined pretty closely in the the revision. Um, and uh, we have made some changes, but not actually to the very much to the wind speeds themselves in Australia, at least. Uh, there have been some changes, and th these are based on um, an extra 20 years, roughly, of Bureau of Meteorology data on wind speeds and directions, which have been reprocessed and extreme value distributions recalculated. And uh, this had resulted in some changes, which are in the dot points there. First of all, for the cyclone regions, uh, we previously had uncertainty factors, FC and FD. Well, essentially the uncertainty has been removed from looking at this extra data, and uh, we're confident to do that. So those factors have gone from the table. Um, there have been some boundary changes and in fact some new regions created. Uh, the new regions are A0, B1 and B2. And in fact region B in the 2011 standard has been split into two parts. B1 is the southeast Queensland part and that's actually dominated more by severe thunderstorms than by tropical cyclones. Whereas B2 is uh, an inland region affected by tropical cyclones. And uh, actually region B1 has been extended further west to from 100 kilometres from the coast to 200 kilometres. So incorporates places like Toowoomba. And again, this is based on um, reprocessing the extreme wind data from the Bureau of Meteorology. Now another significant change is the, uh, the the cyclonic regions C and D. Um, you can interpolate the regional wind speed depending on the distance of your site from the smooth coastline. So if you're in region C right on the coast, for example, um, you get the full wind speed that's in the table. But as you move further inland, uh, that reduces and approaches the the region V2 wind speed. So if you're at 49 kilometers from the coast, you'll be very close to the, your uh, regional wind speed will be close to the, the value given for region B2. Now this just reflects the well-known weakening of tropical cyclones after they cross the coastline. They lose their source of uh, energy from the warm ocean and uh, they weaken pretty rapidly as soon as they cross the coast. Well, this is the new map of Australia in the 2021 version. Um, and I've highlighted in red there, these new regions are A0 and B1. Uh, I mentioned B1 earlier, but the um, region A0 is also an inland region, basically 200 kilometers from the smooth coastline all, um, all, all around the coastline of the country of Australia. Um, that's also a region that's dominated by severe downbursts from thunderstorms. Uh, so the large scale synoptic winds are not having a great effect in that region. Whereas that they in the, along the coastline, especially the southern coastline or southern and eastern coastlines, then we, we tend to have a mixture of um, large scale pressure systems or depressions um, producing winds that blow for a long time, look, most of a day quite often. And uh, sometimes, occasionally, we also get thunderstorms as well, severe thunderstorms. So we have to try to take account of both those type of events. Now, the New Zealanders have also done a lot of reanalysis of their recorded wind speeds. And as a result, have come up with new regional boundaries for New Zealand. You can see the New Zealand map there in the 2021 version. I think the main change is right at the south of the South Island where you see that strip um, at the tip there, which is region NZ4 and includes the Chatham and Auckland Island down the bottom as well. They found that that part of the country had higher wind speed than they previously thought. And uh, so that's been reflected in that new region there. 
I think the, the, the other regional boundaries are not much different from the 20, 2011 version, but there have been changes to the actual wind speeds as well, as well as the direction multipliers. Um, so there are probably more changes in New Zealand than there are in Australia. Well, this is the new Table 31A in uh, 1170.2 2021, uh, the regional wind speeds for Australia. Not a lot of difference from the 2011 version. Um, the parts that are different I've ringed in red there. Uh, so in, if you're in the cyclonic region C and D, it's just emphasising at the top there that it's the maximum value in region C, right at the coastline. And uh, the same with region D in Western Australia. And down that note at the bottom, it's uh, telling you that um, you can actually reduce the wind speeds, as I mentioned earlier, depending on the distance from the smooth coastline. Uh, the other difference is that, of course, that the FC and FD uncertainty multipliers have been removed. Um, there has been a new multiplier introduced which partially uh, accounts for that uh, removal of FC and FD as a climate change multiplier. Well, I'll be talking about that shortly. Well, Clause 3.3 covers the wind direction multiplier, which we've had in uh, the standard for several editions now. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've had roughly 20 years of extra recorded wind data available from the Bureau of Meteorology, so that's enabled us to recalculate the wind direction multiplier as well as the, um, the actual wind speeds themselves. Um, so that's the reason for the new numbers that are, I'll, I'll show on the following slide. So that applies to both Australia and New Zealand. Um, just mentioning that the, um, there's a value fixed at 1.0, so there's no reduction, for structures that have got circular cross sections, so chimneys, tanks, poles. It's also extended to octagonal and similar uh, polygonal cross sections as well. And that one value of 1.0 for MD also applies to cladding in the cyclonic regions. So that's B2, C and D. So this is the new table of wind direction modifiers for Australia, table 32A. Um, there's, um, not much I can really comment without going to a lot of detail on it. There's the, uh, most regions have a westerly dominance. That's where the weather comes from in, um, in Australia. So you'll see 1.0 in the west row in most of those regions. Um, on the right hand end we've got this, the cyclonic region. So what was previously 0.95 as the wind direction modifier for the cyclonic region that's now being reduced to 0 0.90 after we've done some recalculation to, to justify that. Um, so that's um, that's for Australia and I, I won't show the table for New Zealand but uh, uh, similar similar sort of results in that table. Now this standard has to take account of uh, the possible extreme winds that can occur over the lifetime of a structure, which we can take as 50 years as a general average. It could be more or less, depending on the structure importance. Um, now, we all know that there's climate change is happening around the world. It's affecting temperatures and rainfall flooding. Um, uh, but the effect on extreme winds is still pretty uncertain. Uh, we're talking about fairly rare events. So looking at the history of it is doesn't tell us too much, but we do have some numerical models, particularly for tropical cyclones and, and hurricanes, and uh, they've been providing evidence for quite a few years, and they're gradually getting better. Their resolution's been improving, and what they've told us is the there are more likely to be more extreme tropical cyclones impacting the Australian and other coastlines over the next few years or few decades. Um, the evidence is not so clear for some other storms like the thunderstorms and the southern depressions, east coast lows, etc. Um, so the result of that is we've 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 now got a, a new multiplier in the standard, the climate change multiplier, MC. So that's the new table 3.3 .3 you see there. 
Um, so, but the, the only numbers that are different from 1 are for the cyclonic regions, B2, C and D. And you can see ring there that uh, we've got a, a, a value of 1.05. So the evidence is that we're likely to get, a, on average, a 5% increase in extreme winds for those tropical cyclone regions over the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, that we really should try to take account of. And that translates to about a 10% or 10 or 11% increase in wind loads. And uh, for the other regions, uh, for the time being, we've got a value of 1.0 because we're not, there's no clear trend. Uh, but of course, they can be changed in the future. So we've, at least we've got this multiplier in the standard that uh, will be reviewed at fairly regular intervals, maybe every four or five years. And uh, if there's new evidence, we, we can make those changes. Now, clause 4.2 in the standard covers terrain height multiplier. It's a very important part of the standard that basically these multipliers adjust the uh, the gust wind speed from the standard height and terrain of uh, 10 meters on rural or open country terrain to the height of the structure and possibly a different terrain. Um, so quite an important uh, part of the standard that's been there for uh, since the start, basically, of the uh, 1170.2. Now, there have been some changes in the 2021 edition uh, listed there on the slide. So, um, for open water surfaces, uh, terrain category 1 will have to be used now for all open water surfaces. Uh, this is based on so pretty much solid scientific evidence from um, uh, tropical cyclones approaching the land. Uh, from offshore and uh, from the from the United States where they've dropped uh, probes into hurricanes in the Atlantic. Uh, these are indicating uh, quite smooth profiles even in strong winds of hurricanes and tropical cyclones. So all over water surfaces will be terrain category 1 in the future. Um, so one category 1.5 has been removed uh, from the list. Um, terrain category 2.5 though is still retained. Now all these terrain categories are um, the descriptions of um, being checked and varied a little bit. Um, the, the history of them is that people quite often misclassify terrain and uh, some, sometimes the uh, descriptions have been a bit misleading. And finally the last point there is um, this region I0 which I mentioned earlier in Central Australia, which is dominated by these downburst winds. Uh, now these winds are basically a cold air draft coming from above, generated by a thunderstorm, and they're not going to be affected too much by the, um, the terrain. Maybe a few hundred metres, that's all, certainly not a long distance. Uh, we have some measurements in these events, uh, mainly from overseas, but um, and there's a fair bit of scatter in them, but uh, basically the profiles that have come out of that look more like what we have in there for terrain category 2. So the rule is for that central Australia region, A0, the multipliers, the terrain height multipliers listed for terrain category 2 can be used. That doesn't mean that we're reclassifying the terrain itself, it's just was suggesting that the multipliers in there for terrain category 2 are the most appropriate irrespective of what the uh, what the terrain is in that central region. Now there have been some couple of changes in the clause 4.3 covering the shielding multiplier MS. First of all if you've got tall buildings which are defined as buildings with heights greater than 25 meters you're now required to uh, use a shielding monitor at 1.0. In other words no reduction of wind speeds or wind loads for upwind buildings at all. Uh, this came from the wind tunnel people who pointed out that there was, um, they've had several cases where in fact upwind buildings can cause increases in wind loads on other tall buildings. The other change is for buildings on hills and you can see the figure at the bottom there which has been taken out of the new standard. Um, it's quite complicated but um, the black building on the left is halfway up the hill is the building in question which may or may not be shielded. Now the, the white buildings 
uh, to the right are regarded as non shielding mulings for various reasons that are explained in that figure there. It's either due to their distance being more than 20h from the, um, the black building or their height is too, too low or um, they're affected by the slope, the, uh, the flow on the slope which won't impact onto the black building. The grey buildings are regarded as shielding buildings and the one on the left that's ringed, the taller building, that's got a, it's a building whose elevation is actually greater than the building on slope, on the slope um, above sea level. So the top of the, the building actually is greater than the, the black building. Well, clause 4.4 in the standard is, uh, covers a topographic multiplier. And uh, as most people know, the, uh, the effects of topography, hills and escarpments and ridges can be quite significant on wind speeds and wind loads. And we do need to take account of it. Um, fortunately, it's a very difficult to put into a code or standard. Um, we're talking about natural topography here, which is, tends to be three-dimensional. In the standard, we've simplified everything to be nominally two-dimensional. Um, so it hasn't really been changed significantly in the new version. Uh, there's only two real changes there, which I've highlighted there with those dot points. Um, for the, this region A0 in Central Australia, we're talking about these downburst winds. The effect of topography is not significant on, as significant on those winds, we believe, as they are for the, uh, the more boundary layer type winds, the larger storms. So there's a reduced value of MT, topographic modifier for any structures in region A0. Now in New Zealand, they have these downslope winds pretty much all over the country, but particularly in the South Island, um, caused by lee waves, from uh, usually from the westerly winds blowing over the Southern Alps. And they can produce regions, or these lee zones, on the lee side of the mountains, which have extremely high winds for short periods. And um, they've known about this for a long time, but it's difficult to sort of define them accurately. But the, uh, the people at NIWA, particularly Richard Turner there from the New Zealand uh, organization NIWA, has done a pretty good job of re trying to redefine those regions to quite a, a great accuracy. <laughs> so um, there's a big table in the standard showing the, um, the actual coordinates of the various lee zones in, in New Zealand. Well, now moving on to section five, which is the um, uh, shape factors for external and internal pressures on rectangular buildings. A uh, very important section of the standard. Um, now, first of all, internal pressures, that's in clause 5.3. Now, you might recall that uh, there were a lot of changes made in amendment four to the 2011 version of the standard, which I think came out in 2016. Uh, so we, we, we weren't going to make a lot of changes in this revision here since it was done only a few years ago. Just a couple of points there. First of all, on the, um, the table 5.1b, which covers what we call now large openings, greater than 0.5% of the area of a wall or roof, particularly the walls of interest, um, the, the table has been modified a little bit by the addition of um, KA and KL to the bottom of that table there. So um, your internal pressure is a function of the external pressure near the opening, wherever it is, and but also it's the the pressure, the external pressure coefficient multiplied now by the the area reduction factor and the local pressure factor if they're different from one. And I think particularly the local pressure factor is the um, significant one. I think people, again, the wind tunnel people were complaining that the uh, if you have an opening near a windward edge of a wall, it's going to have a much bigger effect on internal pressure than if it was further back on the wall where the flow is sort of reattached on the wall. So the, that uh, KL, that can be, you know, 1.5, 2 or 3, so it can have quite a big effect on the internal pressure. If you happen to have an opening, 
um, that occurs near near a windward wall of a building. So um, you can see that ring there, those KA and KL multipliers have been included. Um, the other change is related to um, the case which is, comes up has come up fairly often. We have a very large building, particularly a low-rise building, a big warehouse or something, or a huge factory with um, you know thousands of cubic meters of volume. People have said, well, surely that has an effect on the internal pressure, reducing the um, the, the, the gust pressures that occur as a result from uh, from a relatively small opening with, with a large volume, and that is true that. Um, we, we've had the theory for that for quite a while. So we've now gone ahead and put in a um, what we call an open area volume factor KV. And just uh, you see the three equations on the, on the right hand side there. Now, so <clears throat> if you have a very large volume and a relatively small open area, then you can get a reduction down to as, uh, as low as 0.85. That's ring, that value is ring there. On the other hand, you can actually get an increase in internal pressures for other situation as a result of uh, what we call um, Helmholtz or internal resonance with fluctuating pressures. Um, but fortunately, there's a lot of damping there, so the, uh, the effect is not that large. But you can get up to, well, according to the standard now, eight, eight and a half in percent increase in internal pressures as a result of that particular combination of area and volume. So that last equation there is a KV is 1.085. So clause 5.4.2 and table 5.4 covers the area reduction factor, which in previous standards only was applicable to roofs and sidewalls. Uh, well, in the 2021 version of the standard, it's been extended to windward walls and leeward walls. And uh, you can see the extra columns in the table there that are ringed in red. There have been a couple of changes in clause 5.4.4, which covers the local pressure factor. Um, an extra case has been added for high pitched gable roofs. We're calling that one RC2, and the, the example of the area that's applicable to is shown in red on the slide there. The second one is. Um, for very large roofs. Some uh, wind tunnel tests a few years ago indicated that uh, the standard was not conservative for the um, in la inner part of uh, a large low pitch roof on uh, a large warehouse building. So that the way that's been fixed is to change the definition of A for very large roofs. If both H on B and H on D are less than 0.2, the, the value of A is, um, becomes 2H instead of H in the previous uh, edition of the standard. Now moving on to section 6 in the standard, dynamic response factor. Um, the first page is um, the, the introduction and, and two other sections describe what um, structures we're talking about um, and also what structures and what are their dynamic characteristics for structures that are not covered by the standard. Um, there's a whole group of those. And also another section for which um, the c dyne or the dy dynamic response factor is equal to 1.0. In other words, for which the dynamic effects from wind are negligible. And then following on from that, we've, we cover a long wind response, which of course has been covered in every, almost every edition of the standard going right back to the 1970s. Uh, it was covered previously for tall buildings, basically. Um, now we've extended it for some other types of structures. Uh, and you can see the two clauses on the slide there. So 642 covers towers, poles, and masts, in which you have a very slender structure with a large area supported on top, which could be a, a, a light fitting or a a set of um, antennas for mobile phones. You can see there in the in the diagrams. So that's the, they're the kind of structures we're talking about here, where the area that's catching the wind load is pretty much sitting on top of the, the structure itself, and there's very little area on the actual supporting structure. So that's in section 642. And then we've got another section for horizontal 
structures uh, and their dynamic response factor for a long wind response in section 643. Now clause 6.5 in the 21, 2021 edition covers crosswind response. Actually the clause numbers have changed a little bit in the uh, new edition. Um, so it covers crosswind response of uh, rectangular buildings or buildings of roughly rectangular cross section and also um, circular cross section chimneys, masts and poles. Now for the rectangular section for the tall buildings there have been some changes to the crosswind force spectrum coefficient, the CFS, for three out of the four cross sections. Uh, down the bottom of the slide you can see um, the new graph for one of those cross sections, a six to two to one rectangular section. Now for the, uh, the chimneys, masts and poles of circular section, we've introduced a completely new method, uh, more advanced than the one that was in the 2011 edition. Uh, it's actually come from Europe, from uh, Denmark, basically. Um, it's quite a bit more, more complex, but it, we believe it's a bit more accurate than uh, what we had previously. And uh, that's in section clause or cl clause 6.5.3. Right, now moving on to the appendices. Um, these in general contain additional shape factors and pressure coefficients for structures that are not rectangular enclosed buildings. And over the years, there's been more and more requests from users to um, include extra information. So now I think these appendices are occupying about 40% of the, the standard. So this is a, from Appendix A, which was formerly Appendix C in the 2011 version. One of the sections in there covers curved roofs, uh, which include arched and dome roofs. So you see the table A3 there for um, curved roofs. Uh, this is a completely different table from the previous edition. And, uh, but it includes the, the variation with the rise to span ratio and a different set of numbers for when the, the roof sort of starts at ground level and, or if it starts from an elevated wall in the bottom half of that table there. So these have been compiled from uh, wind tunnel tests in Australia, a certain number, and, but a lot from overseas as well that have been published. Uh, this, there were most of these tests, I think, or just about all of those tests were from models of arched roofs, but they'd be um, conservative for dome roofs. Appendix B covers structures and elements for which we give net pressure coefficients uh, across a surface like a freestanding wall, a free, free roof, or attached canopies. Uh, those pretty much stayed the same since um, from the previous edition. But we've added some new material in there. One of them is for the, uh, on the left there, you can see conical canopies, which are probably not very common, but uh, they do occur in mining areas to cover, uh, use for covering stockpiles. Uh, we had some wind tunnel tests done through a particular client and uh, that information has been included in the standard there. You can see the figure B6 conical canopies. Now it all, that section or that appendix also covers solar panels both on roof and on ground. There's been a whole new section B62 added for solar panels array on ground, uh, in other words solar farms. Uh, again there was some wind tunnel sponsored wind tunnel testing done and that information was made available for the standard. I think the, um, the testing only included like two rows of panels um, and uh, so there is a, there's a limit of um, shielding, the effects of shielding has been included. But I think for if you've got a really large solar farm with uh, lots of rows then the, probably the shielding would be conservative in that case. Um, but it doesn't cover the tracking solar panels, which if you know anything about that industry, they, they track from morning till evening. The, the panels are actually rotating about a big axis from morning till evening. Those we haven't really covered. I think there is some information from overseas. Some of it, a lot of it's commercially incompetence. Um, 
but we might be able to add something in the future for those types of uh, solar farm systems which I think are becoming quite common. Now rooftop solar. Uh, these were covered for parallel or flush mounted panels on pitch roofs in um, the 2011 standard in section D6 and table D11. Uh, that table has been retained in the new standard. It's now table B12. You can see that on the slide there. The numbers are exactly the same, I think, as the 2011 version. What has changed beneath the table, though, is uh, some clarification on the appropriate aerodynamic shape factors for the roof beneath the panels. And as you can see there, that the um, when the net pressure or the shape factor for the uh, the panel is negative, then the shape factor for the top of the roof, external pressure on the top of the roof is positive, so it takes the opposite sign and vice versa. So the effect of that is you'll actually get a reduced load. It will be something like the the load on the roof if the panels weren't there. Uh, the, the combination of the panel load plus the, the roof underneath shouldn't change that much when you've got a flush mounted panel on a, on a roof. So there was clarification there. What we what we haven't covered though are the um, inclined solar panels on flat or near flat roofs on framing. Uh, and there's a we were aware there's a big tendency to include these on big warehouse buildings, usually at about 10 degrees, because then they become self-cleaning. Um, we haven't covered those at the moment. There there is a um, a guide from the United States from from California that could be used. Although the, the buildings that were used in the testing were about 30 meters square in plan, so not really covering the um, the aerodynamics of the very large warehouse roofs of 100 plus meter length and similar width. So this is something for the future. Now Appendix E in the uh, the old standard 2011 version covered aerodynamic choke factors for exposed structural members, frames, and lattice towers. It was already a fairly lengthy appendix. That's now become Appendix C in the 2021 version, and pretty much unchanged. Um, so what we're doing in there is covering, if you like, porous structures where there's flow through them, such as lattice towers. Um, now, there's been questions asked, I think, over the years. I've had various people asking me about, what well, could this be applied to sort of industrial complexes like you know mining complexes or petrochemical plants um, which is which are also porous but consist of a large number of individual elements um, how can we apply it and of course they are all individual systems themselves and I think a lot of people have tried to use look at the individual elements and just add up the um, the wind forces on each element you're going to be extremely conservative if you do that there's a lot of shielding and interference going on there which tends to reduce the overall loads on the uh, the whole complex and also the individual elements so all we've done there is, a, is put in a series of informative notes about how you can apply um, basically the section on building frames in the standard and how that can be applied to um, those industrial complexes. Well, as I said at the beginning, I was only planning to cover the main changes uh, in the new standard. There's a lot of small changes which I haven't talked about today. Um, but I should say the um, a lot of people will be aware that we've had this wind loading handbook for Australia and New Zealand that's been out since 2012. Uh, and accompany the, the 2011 version. Uh, there's a lot of useful information in there about uh, the background to the, the uh, clauses in the standard and also some extra information that might be useful that hasn't actually got into the standard. Um, now there is a plan to revise that handbook. It should be available probably next year, 2022. There's a fair bit of work involved in revising it, but um, there are, we've had some plans drawn up to do that. Uh, and I think in the, the new version of that handbook, they, we will include the 11 to 12 examples on using the standard, which have been available separately as a, um, a CD-ROM or as a USB stick. Some people may have um, obtained that, those examples. Um, 
So look out for that in the future. And I think if you check the uh, the website of the Australasian Wind Engineering Society, www.awes.org, uh, you should see that come up in the future, a few months away. Well, this started as a bit like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and the painting never gets finished. Once I've finished one round of painting, they go back to the beginning straight away and start working on the, the next round. So the standard, uh, we've already started thinking about amendments to the 2021 version of 1170.2. In fact, a proposal is already in progress with the Standards Australia to start working on that. Um, so I'll just mention a couple of items that are in that proposal, so you can expect that in the future. Unfortunately, these were um, the need for these was not apparent until about a year ago, and it was too late to include in the 2021 edition. Uh, one of them is the revision of the boundaries of Region D in Western Australia. Uh, people will be aware this is the, the highest wind region in the country, affected by frequent and reasonably strong tropical cyclones. Um, the two things we want to do there is revise the, um, the boundaries, both north and south boundaries. Uh, at the present day, they run between 20 degrees south and 25 degrees south. And you can divide it up into those two sections there. The one, one of them is a sort of a, a southwest northeast section. Uh, the other one is a, uh, the, the Gascoigne coast, which runs roughly north south. Now, it turns out the Gascoigne coast, the north south running part, hardly ever gets impact from tropical cyclones in the last 60 years. And when they have happened, they've been weak ones. So places like Carnarvon have probably been uh, put in the wrong region. This is, this is something that happened 30 years ago and uh, probably was not looked at at that, at that time. So I think um, that strip probably should be in region C, not in region D. And now the north side, turns out that the, the strip between 19 and 20 degrees, which is currently in region C, it gets affected by a lot of severe tropical cyclones over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. And down the bottom left, you can see a lot of the impacts that have occurred. Um, and I think there's a good reason to upgrade that section to Region D. Um, so we're going to su suggest changes at, on, both on the north and south sides of the boundaries there. Well, many of you will recall we had a tropical cyclone Sarosia. Uh, earlier in 2021, in April actually, 2021, that crossed the coast close to a place called Kalbari in Western Australia, which is um, I think a few hundred kilometres north of Perth. So it's getting a lot close to Perth there. But it is in Region B2, which is expected to be affected by tropical cyclones. But unfortunately, the, um, the clauses on internal pressure that have been uh, were included in, in the uh, 2011 version for cyclonic region didn't include this region B2, only C and D. So, but in fact, uh, Dr. Jeff Borden, who's one of our committee members from Western Australia, went up there and looked at the damage after the cyclone impact and found there was a lot of cases of um, debris failure on windward walls and other walls, producing high internal pressures. Um, and uh, this resulted in uh, collapse of the building or at least removal of the roof or parts of the roofs of a lot of buildings in that town. So the proposal will be in the future to include region B2 in the internal pressure requirements for cyclonic regions that are currently in the, in the standard. Um, another um, amendment we, we would expect is uh, for the inclined rooftop solar on large warehouse buildings that I mentioned earlier, a few, a few slides ago. Well, I said at the start of this uh, presentation, there are a lot of other contributors to the revision of 1170.2 2021. And I've listed some of them on the slide here. On the left, you see about half the committee members from BD62, which looks after wind actions. I've only put the, the people that have mainly contributed the technical input to the standard, and there's a lot of other people that have contributed at, at the meetings we've had. 
Uh, over on the right, we've got um, Phil. I've mentioned Phil Blundy there. He's the chair of BD6, which is the overseeing committee which looks after all the loading standards for Standards Australia. And uh, he's also a volunteer. And then down the bottom right, we ha we've had three project managers from Standards Australia. These are the employees of Standards Australia. They organize the meetings, prepare minutes of meetings, prepare the drafts, and generally get us through the various administrative hurdles you need to cross to put out a standard like this. So we certainly appreciate their efforts and I was, I'm happy to acknowledge them. Uh, bearing in mind that they've got a lot of other committees to look after. This is just one part of their, of their workload. So uh, we had over 230 public comments submitted in the public comment period last year. And every one of those comments were dealt with by the committee and uh, we made a lot of changes as a result to the standard. So it was probably approaching 100 people that put in comments. So again, we should give thanks to those people for taking an interest in the standard and producing a better document as a result of it. Well, that's all I had prepared to, to say about the, um, the revisions in the, the new version of AS. NZS 1170.2. Thank you for listening. Now, if I happen to be uh, on the end of a line somewhere at the time you're hearing this, I can, I'm happy to answer questions. Um, if it's been given remotely and I'm not available, then uh, feel free to send me an email. My email address is on the slide there. Um, and I look forward to uh, getting some responses. Thank you.